that blood dry. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if he still has it, but yeah. Or better yet, one of these from the Wizard of Oz. Those guys that had, you know, the monkeys. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The <laughs> Wicked Witch is back.
Somebody named Taylor. Okay, uh, good morning everyone, thank you for being here. Um, I wanted to start off by drawing attention to something that happened on June 29th of this year in in another city, um, a four-year-old Kansas City boy named Legend Talaferro went to bed that night and he never woke up. While he was laying in his own bed in his own home asleep, Legend Talaferro was killed by a bullet that was fired into his home. And Legend's death is a tragic example of far too many murders, shootings, and other violent crime that have gripped our nation over the past several months. And in response to this alarming rise in violent crime across the nation, on July 8th, the Department of Justice announced the launch of Operation Legend, a violent crime reduction effort that works through existing federal, state, and local partnerships in certain cities. So last week, Operation Legend was expanded to include Chicago and Albuquerque, 
And today, we announce that Operation Legend has come to Cleveland. I will go into the details of what this means in a moment, but at the outset, I want to offer a few points of clarification. First, Operation Legend is a violent crime reduction effort, period. There are additional resources that are being provided to federal, state, and local law enforcement to assist in traditional crime fighting that will be directed at gang violence, narcotics-related shootings, and illegal firearms. That's what it is. That's what Operation Legend is. What it is not is an, it's not an introduction of federal riot police. It is not an introduction of federal uniform personnel. It is not an introduction of federal agents to protect federal property. We are bringing federal investigators into Cleveland to protect our residents and to prevent firearm violence. I think, as Chief Williams put it last week, and I'm paraphrasing here, but nobody is talking about sending federal troops to Cleveland. That is not in the cards. That is not what we are talking about here today. A second point, Operation Legend is not going to look the same in every city. So unlike Chicago and Kansas City, where we have literally hundreds of federal investigators who are being integrated into violent crime task forces, Cleveland is going to see a much more modest uh, federal uh, number of federal investigators, approximately 25. And they're going to be drawn from the ATF, the DEA, FBI, and ultimately, we hope, the U.S. Marshal Service. An important point, though, is that these investigators are dedicated to long-term criminal investigative efforts in Cleveland. They are going to be permanently reassigned by their federal agencies, and they will work with additional task force officers who are being provided from the Cleveland Division of Police, the Ohio State Highway Patrol, the Ohio Investigative Unit, and the Ohio Adult Parole Authority. This is the best of federal, state, and local partnerships, and it's what we do every day. But here we are able to bring, bring to bear additional substantial resources to deliver safety and security for the residents of Cleveland. Third, this is the right time to do this. And any sense of urgency that you may sense from us is born out of a need to prevent additional murders and shootings. As of the latest data, Cleveland's homicides are up over 13% from where they were in 2019. And even more alarming, our city's felonious assaults by a firearm, otherwise known as non-fatal shootings, are up over 35% from where they were a year ago. Those non-fatal shootings are, just, are often just millimeters away from becoming another homicide. And based on historical trends, we don't expect a let up in violent crime as we head into late summer and early fall. In fact, last September saw 19 homicides in Cleveland, and that was the worst month of the year. And the four-month period from September to December saw the most homicides of any, uh, any four-month period in 2019. That was worse even than late spring and summer. So we have definitely picked the right time to kick off Operation Legend in Cleveland. Now, I will turn it over to the mayor and the chief in just a moment, but I, I want to emphasize something that they have both said recently. The planning for this effort dates back many months to De December of 2019, when the Department of Justice announced the initiative called Operation Relentless Pursuit. Uh, and the announcement at that time said that that would be rolled out in seven cities, including Cleveland. And since then, we have actually had one operational phase that was led by the U.S. Marshals, uh, and we'll have additional detail on that in just a moment. But we had to delay additional operations due to the onset of COVID-19. And so the point here is that the planning for these additional federal agents and our state and local task force officers goes back many months. The number of contemplated personnel is the same as we discussed over those several months. There is additional funding that has been made available through Operation Legend. And we are part of a larger nationwide effort that did not exist in December 2019. But I just want to emphasize this. The nuts and bolts of the investigative focus has been the product of much effort by all these people here on stage. And they all have my personal thanks for working so hard on delivering this initiative for the people of Cleveland. And now I'll turn it over to Cleveland Mayor Frank Jackson. Thank you. Um, as you know, we've had a long-standing relationship with our federal partners. And because of that relationship, we've been able to accomplish many things over the years since I've been mayor, and I know even before I became mayor. This recent uh, uh, initiative, uh, Operation Legend, is part of that ongoing support. And as was mentioned by the U.S. Attorney, uh, data shows, our statistics shows, and if you're out on the streets, you will know that uh, violent crimes are up, particularly violent crimes with guns. And we do need the assistance of our federal partners in order to help us uh, bring
bring that under control. Uh, the details of our relationship into this uh, operation, I'll let the chief explain to you. Chief. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, I'm not going to get too deep into the details uh, because there are a lot of things that uh, we're talking about with our federal partners, our state and our local partners. There are a lot of things that we still have to work out. Uh, what I do want to do is um, thank our partnership. Uh, you see a lot of them here on the stage. Uh, thank Mr. Herdman, the attorney for the Northern District here, who kind of spearheaded this and actually got Cleveland into con the consideration. Uh, late last year to actually get this operation to start here, so uh, I appreciate it. Uh, the mayor and uh, Mr. Hurtman have touched on what this is. This is a violent crime initiative here in the city of Cleveland and some of our surrounding communities. Uh, I just real quick want to touch on something that's kind of brewed out there uh, probably since last week, since there was an announcement from Washington, D.C. on federal assets going to different cities across the country, and Cleveland was mentioned in that. Uh, I just want to tell the people of Cleveland, uh, like the mayor and I said last week in our press conference, you know, we will never bring folks here to harm our residents, period. And our residents need to understand that there are folks out there that want to spew hate, that want to spew dissension, that want anarchy and chaos here in our country and definitely here in our city. Don't believe the hype. Don't buy into it. Uh, if they don't live in your neighborhood, if they don't experience what you experience day in and day out, then question their motives on what they're putting out there. The people that live in this city know what's going on. They understand the help that's needed to get this thing under control. So I implore the people who are in the city, don't let people that don't live with you, that don't experience the things you do, talk you out of something that's going to be of assistance to this city. It's vitally important especially in this day and age, that we get things under control and we get things right here in the city. And that's what the folks here on the stage, that's what we're committed to do. So there's been a lot of rhetoric out there about federal police and stormtroopers and all this other stuff that goes around. Don't believe the hype. The folks here on this stage are here to help the citizens of this city so that you can sit on your porch at 8 o'clock at night on a nice summer day and enjoy yourself. Your kids can go to the park and the playground and enjoy themselves, period. That's what we're here for. So, again, I ask you, don't believe the hype. Believe your eyes and ears and what's going on out there and what needs to be done to stem the tide of violence here in this city. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Mr. Hurt. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Uh, so as I just said, you know, we, we did announce Operation Relentless Pursuit in December of 2019. And then in January of this year, the U.S. Marshals commenced what they do better than anyone else in the world, a violent fugitive apprehension effort. And by any measure, that uh, initiative was tremendously successful. Unfortunately, COVID-19 cut short our ability to immediately follow on with the criminal investigations that we're announcing today. And as you may understand, I think, from, from the history and, and watching what the U.S. Marshals do, we did not announce uh, that operation at the time that it was underway because the effect that such publicity can have on the effectiveness of that operation uh, when you're looking for fugitives, uh, but also has uh, the potential to uh, result in reduced officer safety if we let everyone know what we're doing. Um, so I've asked uh, Brian Fitzgibbon from the U.S. Marshal Service to run through the conclusion of Operation Relentless Pursuit and the results of this violent fugitive apprehension effort. Brian? Thank you, Justin, and good morning, everybody. Um, like Justin said, uh, the United States Marshal Service uh, is partnered with all the uh, folks that you see on the stage, all the agencies that are uh, in together to protect and serve the uh, fine citizens of the city of Cleveland. More importantly, we're in partnership with those citizens. Uh, I would like to go over this slide that you'll see uh, projected uh, throughout the room of, of some of the, the stats that were an outcome of the operation. The operation began on, on January the 13th and went until March 31st. As Mr. Herdman uh, made note of, it had to end on March 31st due to the uh, pandemic. 
the United States Marshal Service partnered with the folks we work with every single day. We partnered with the United States Attorney's Office, the Cleveland Division of Police, Ohio Adult Parole Authority, Ohio State Highway Patrol, Cuyahoga County Sheriff's Department, ATF, and the FBI. Um, I can't forget DEA, too, one of our strongest partners. Um, I didn't write this, Gene. Uh, so, um, so we did this together with one common goal, was to reduce violence and get guns off the streets. While putting the operation together, we brought in 21 Deputy United States Marshals from uh, duty stations across the country to backfill the team that already exists. The team that exists on a daily basis works with all those par partners I outlined, as well as dozens of others throughout the region in our district. Those teams took the lead. The TV wires, as we call them, those folks that were assigned to this operation, filled in the spots so we could ultimately triplicate our impact on violent crime. The Cleveland Division of Police, Cuyahoga County Sheriff, Highway Patrol, and Parole all provided additional staff, as well as the United States Marshal Service. As a result, 344 violent fugitives were arrested during phase one of Operation Relentless Pursuit. Just to gauge where the numbers are, if you compare it to our team, our Northern Ohio Violent Fugitive Task Force that operates on a daily basis with all of our partners, those same numbers during that same time were in 2018 we had 96 arrests. In 2019 we had 187 arrests. More importantly, there was uh, the amount of guns that were seized uh, off the streets as a result of Operation Relentless Pursuit. We seized 31 firearms off the streets for arrests that were made during this operation, compared to just six in 2019 and three in 2018. We know collaboratively as law enforcement, as leaders in this community, that those guns are responsible for the murders that are taking place in the streets of Cleveland. just want to highlight a couple of the arrests that were made because of the expedited response from the additional staffing that was brought in. We had a felonious assault suspect who fired a shot at the team as they were executing an arrest warrant. He was arrested with a 9mm loaded handgun. We also had a rape and kidnapping suspect who targeted a 61-year-old and a 41-year-old female at Brookside Reservation in the Metro Parks. As soon as that suspect was identified, these teams of trained fugitive investigators had the person in custody within hours. Lastly, I want to conclude with a statement on behalf of the United States Marshal Pete Elliott, who could not be here today. We, the United States Marshals, have a long-standing partnership with the Cleveland Division of Police, the Cuyahoga County Sheriff's Department, Ohio State Highway Patrol, and the Ohio Adult Parole Authority, as well as our federal partners, in apprehending violent fugitives. Oper Operation Relentless Pursuit and Operation Legend will build upon these strong relationships and strengthen our commitment to protect and serve the citizens of the fine city of Cleveland and the surrounding areas. Thank you, Justin. Thanks, Brian. So as you just heard, the, the active portion of Operation Relentless Pursuit effectively concluded in April with the U.S. Marshals Initiative. One point that I'd like to make is, you know, we talked about the dramatic rise in violent crime uh, that we've seen uh, over the past several months. You know, really by the conclusion of, uh, of Relentless Pursuit in, uh, in late March, early April, um, we, were, we were fairly stable in terms of overall um, violent crime numbers, uh, felonious assaults by firearm. Uh, as well as homicides, um, and that, that changed um, uh, over the ensuing months. So, um, so what we're doing under Operation Legend is we're focusing on long-term investigations that will ultimately reduce violent crime in Cleveland. Uh, we know that this works. We are building off the foundation laid not only by Operation Relentless Pursuit, but as the Marshal said, decades of federal, state, and local partnerships that have been used to combat narcotics trafficking, the opioid overdose epidemic, human trafficking, child exploitation, terrorism, and a host of other offenses. So what does this look like in Cleveland? We're going to have permanently reassigned federal personnel in Cleveland. That means folks moving here 
uh, either straight from the academy or from other uh, field offices or divisions of their respective agencies. And we're going to have approximately 25 federal investigators uh, who will be permanently reassigned here. That's adding to the federal footprint in Cleveland. And if we're adding, these are criminal investigators. Uh, these are uh, the, the federal equivalent of street cops. Um, working closely with uh, all of our task force officers. Uh, we'll have uh, at least six DEA personnel who are assigned here. Uh, we'll have at least 10 additional ATF agents, which, which is huge for us uh, to be able to have access to um, that increased capacity from ATF. We'll have at least seven FBI personnel, and we hope to be able to confirm soon that we'll be getting some additional Deputy U.S. Marshals, uh, which are so critical for our violent fugitive apprehension efforts. We're expecting anywhere from at least two uh, to up to five Deputy U.S. Marshals. So because it takes time for agents and deputies to be permanently reassigned, we have investigators here in Cleveland on temporary duty to fill that gap in person personnel replacements until they can come online permanently. I think you can understand why we would need to do that. Um, those investigators are already assigned to enforcement groups that are focused on violent crime reduction. So for the FBI, they're focusing on cases like pattern robberies of commercial establishments, carjackings, I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment, and also uh, really critical assistance to Cleveland Division of Police on homicide investigations. For ATF, um, they are essential in uh, our work to identify uh, those who are engaged in firearms violence and to reduce the number of shootings that are taking place in our city. They do that um, in large part, but not exclusively, but one of the things that they do that no one else does is they assist in the collection and analysis of ballistic evidence um, and also the use of analytical tools to help identify crime guns and violent shooters. The DEA, um, they are employing investigative strat strategies, just as an example, that are focused on locations where we know those locations and drug trafficking at those locations is contributing to violent crime. And I'll have an example of that in just a moment as well. Uh, but this is especially critical when it comes to our federal ability to work investigations that involve violent drug trafficking operations and narcotics gangs. And then obviously you heard what the marshals do. As I said, they do it better than any, anyone else in the world. Um, they're going to apprehend violent fugitives and often we find that those fugitives who are wanted for crimes like homicide or rape or uh, assault, uh, they're often armed when we come into contact with them uh, and to arrest them. So there's also a substantial component of Operation Legend that involves assistance to state and federal law enforcement. Cleveland Division of Police has been um, awarded almost $8 million that will help hire 30 police officers. Ohio State Highway Patrol and the Ohio Investigative Unit has been awarded over $1.2 million to bring online five personnel and onboard five personnel for both of those agencies, uh, collectively for both of those agencies. And then the Ohio Adult Parole Authority, a very important partner for us, uh, has been awarded $750,000 to bring on uh, four officers into their agency. And all these agencies are making available to our federal task forces a corresponding number of credentialed federal task force officer. So again, you see in practice that federal, state, and local partnership. Operation Legend is also making additional funds available to our state and local partners. This includes through the Bureau of Justice Assistance a total of $2.4 million that can be used to pay for overtime or equipment uh, for those police officers and agents who are contributing to federal task force operations. We also have more than $1.2 million awarded to our four federal agencies under the Joint Law Enforcement Operations Fund. And that will be used for reimbursing state and local law enforcement for their task force assistance. But uh, I want to highlight one part of this. Uh, this money also includes $100,000 that ATF has specifically requested to help Cleveland defray costs associated with the installation or maintenance of shot detection technology. Um, so that's an important point to emphasize here. So the timing of this announcement also enables us to provide some initial results since the
by violence prone locations and locations that are contributing to overall violent crime in the city. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about ATF. Next slide. So uh, ATF is, as I said, is a critical partner in using technology to identify crime guns and more importantly, those who are pulling the triggers of those guns. ATF uses the National Integrated Ballistic Information Network, also known as NIBIN, to essentially fingerprint every gun that is used in a homicide, shooting, or other crime. This enables us to link related shootings and generate leads for follow-up by our federal task forces and local detectives who are working these cases. So since July 15th, ATF has already taken 12 guns into custody and has generated 11 NIBIN leads. We expect that number to increase significantly over the coming days and weeks. These are numbers that will absolutely lead to taking illegal guns and violent criminals off the street. And then I will, uh, I'll turn over to FBI uh, Special Agent in Charge Eric Smith in just a moment, but today we are also going to be announcing federal carjacking charges that have been filed against James Bell III of Cleveland. He stuck a firearm in the face of a driver in the middle of a June afternoon, about 3.30 p.m., uh, out at Eastgate Plaza in Mayfield Heights. Um, we have all too often seen carjacking as a crime that is committed in furtherance of other offenses, such as drive-by shootings, and we are especially grateful to the hardworking FBI agents and prosecutors who work diligently to identify this perpetrator and take him into custody. Carjacking is a federal offense, and when a firearm is involved, it will carry substantial mandatory penalties. So as I promised, I want to now turn it over to Eric Smith, who is uh, our special agent in charge here in Cleveland, to discuss some additional FBI resources uh, that are being directed to help close a recent homicide stemming from a carjacking. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for being here. As Justin said, my name is uh, Eric Smith, and I'm the special agent in charge of the FBI's Cleveland Field Office. A special welcome to Mayor Jackson. You know, it's always great to start the day when I can stand up here with uh, our federal law enforcement and state and local partners who also, also happen to be uh, friends. It has emphasized we have for months worked on Operation Relentless Pursuit with great success and have parlayed that into Operation Legend. You know, we often attempt to highlight law enforcement's collaborative efforts during press conferences and press releases, but this is truly the epitome of collaboration between law enforcement agencies uh, and between law enforcement and the community. And uh, all with a singular focus to combat and reduce violent crime. You know, as we have done for 112 years, the FBI will work alongside our state, local, and federal partners, providing any and all resources to address the wanton and indiscriminate violence that at times shocks the conscience of both the public and seasoned law enforcement professionals. We are here to hold those accountable for those responsible for violent crimes and to permanently disable criminal networks from perpetuating these acts in the future. To illustrate my point in terms of partnership uh, and wanton violence, we are actively seeking and uh, working with the police uh, department here in Cleveland for the senseless killing of Eric Haki Zimana. To remind everyone of the horrific circumstances, Eric was returning home from soccer practice on May 25th, 2020, when he stopped at a red traffic signal at the intersection of West 80th and Detroit streets. Eric was violently pulled out of his vehicle, shot, and left to die on the streets of Cleveland. His murderer then drove away in Eric's vehicle. Eric was just 17 years old, driving home from soccer, an innocent person obeying a traffic signal. He was almost certainly a victim of being at the wrong place at the wrong time. It is believed the unknown shooter was fleeing the area after killing another individual, 31-year-old Curtis Legg, in front of his residence um, on West 83rd. Eric's family are refugees from their home country of the Democratic Republic of Congo, having fled war and violence there for a refugee camp in Uganda. After years at this camp, Eric and his family came to the United States unable to imagine violence would follow them to a streetlight at West 80th in Detroit, 
with the sudden and tragic loss of their son. We're asking anyone with information about the senseless killing of Eric Hakizamana to please call the FBI at 216-622-6842, Crime Stoppers, or the Cleveland Police Department. A reward of up to $25,000 is being offered if you're Operation Legend for information leading to the successful identification and prosecution of the individual or individuals responsible for Eric's murder. All information is kept confidential and tips may be made anonymously. Thank you. It is vital that law enforcement and the community continue to work with one another to ensure dangerous, violent criminals are held accountable in a court of law. All of us on this stage, in this room, and listening to or reading these comments want to live in safe, crime-free communities. Please help us to ensure that that happens. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Eric. You know, that's, uh, that's a really poignant reminder of the, um, the reward that's being announced for information leading to uh, an arrest uh, for someone who committed Eric's death. Um, that um, uh, we, we have our own legends here in Cleveland. We have plenty of them. Um, but it's, it's really important for us uh, to focus on preventing additional victims of violent crime in Cleveland. That's what this effort is ultimately all about. And, you know, we have to admit that we live in a world where, as it currently stands, not every four-year-old child has the same chance to wake up safely in the morning. That is a tragedy in and of itself. But what we can do in law enforcement is to try to give every mother and father out there additional confidence that when they tuck their kids into bed, that will not be the last time that they ever get to say goodnight to them. We, the people up here on the stage, we are just as fed up with the violence as the community. We are committed to getting this right. And the violent criminals who are out there should know that we are here to stay. I think we can take some questions now. So you guys have uh, talked a lot about all of the officers that are going to be coming mm -hmm. into the city of Cleveland. Um, you haven't talked much about training. And obviously, we know that there's a lot of scrutiny um, under police departments right now. We see our racial justice uprising all over the country. So what are you guys going to be doing when you're bringing all of these officers here and you have a very large community that has a huge distrust for the police department? What are you guys going to be doing to make sure that those people are getting the bad guys and, you know, yeah. get better? It's a fair question. So what, what we always do, and, and you know, I'll point to the Marshall's operation as an example of this, uh, we always use um, the first couple days of any operation to provide onboard training, not only to people who are coming in from out of town, but also to other, uh, whether it's locals or state law enforcement or federal law enforcement who are contributing to an effort, uh, literally days of training. And so um, it's not just on tactical uh, uh, pieces that are, re are required for being able to safely enter buildings. It's also focusing on what the law is, uh, what the neighborhoods are like, um, where the streets run. Um, it's all of that kind of training that's provided to people when they come online in any kind of operation. And that's just in addition to the training that they get through more formal means like you know, regular training that they receive uh, through their agencies uh, or through an academy, something like that. But yes, there is, it's something that, that I think we've gotten very good at, which is identifying the need for there to be that initial training period for folks who are contributing to these efforts and then actually coming up with a way for us to deliver really good training to them. A follow-up question to that, are you guys focusing on uh, hiring diverse officers that reflect the city of Cleveland? Well, um, so we, we contribute the funds to the city. I don't know, Chief, if you want to talk about your recruitment efforts at all, but that's really the Chief's wheelhouse. We give him the money and he uh, onboards the people into the academy. Uh, of course we are. I mean, that's what the, <clears throat> what the city of Cleveland, that's what the mayor is all about, making sure that we have a diverse work workforce, not just in the Division of Police, but throughout the city. And uh, probably Eric can also chime in here. Uh, you know, our federal partners are seeking to do the same thing. And the, the folks that are here now are, are the temporary duty folks. Uh, when academies graduate from our respective federal agencies, then they'll have permanently assigned folks here. Uh, as Justin said earlier, that will move here, move their families here, put their kids in school here. That will be a part of this community. So, of course, we want that to be a diverse group of folks. Any other questions? 
how, how are we funding this? Is that are they still going to be paid by the federal government? I know you talked about the city of Cleveland getting eight million dollars, but are they still being paid by the federal government, or is this taxpayer money? So it's federal federal dollars through what's called the COPS hiring grant that's being used to hire these police officers. We make that money available to the city. The city draws down on that money and then is able over the course of three years to pay for those police officers that they've onboarded through that program. Um, the, the other money that I talked about, the Bureau of Justice Assistance money, uh, the Joint Law Enforcement Operations Fund money, that's federal money, federal dollars that have already been appropriated and are being directed towards this effort. The firearms being confiscated, where are they coming from? Well, that's part of what the ATF uh, is, uh, that's part of their job, right, is to figure out where are these things from. Are they from a um, firearm store uh, robbery or burglary? Are they um, burglarized out of a residence? Is there a straw purchaser who's involved? Is there a larger network of firearms trafficking? So I can't get into the details of that right now, uh, but it's something that we always look at anytime we seize a gun. Uh, that's the kind of thing that we work with the police department to ensure that we're, tr we're trying to identify where that gun may have come from, and if there's somebody who's out there trafficking, we want to identify them and include them in our enforcement strategy. Thank you, I appreciate it. If anybody needs any uh, slides or anything else talked about today, let me know. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you can roll through the slides uh, clean. Uh, heads or anything in the way. Yeah, I think you're going to Yeah. Oh, wow. Thank you. 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 Thank you.